You ever stop and think about what's actually happening behind the curtain at places like Google or Netflix? I mean, how on earth do they handle the insane amount of data we all create every single second? Well, today, that's exactly what we're going to do. We're diving deep into the world of big data and demystifying the incredible technologies that make our modern digital world even possible. So it all really boils down to this one simple but absolutely critical question. Picture this. You build an app, and it's a smash hit. Suddenly, the data you're collecting, it just doesn't fit on one computer anymore. Your trusty old database starts to creak, it slows down, and then, boom, it just breaks. That breaking point is the very reason big data systems were invented. And this just lays it all out, doesn't it? On one side, you've got your traditional database. It lives on a single, powerful server. It loves neat, perfectly structured data. But it has a ceiling. It can only get so big. On the other side? A big data system. We're talking a sprawling network of thousands of regular computers all working together, ready for literally any kind of data you can throw at it. It's built for internet scale. So, how do they pull it off? Okay, let's start at the absolute foundation of the whole thing, storage. This is problem number one. If you have a petabyte of data, and that's a million gigabytes by the way, how in the world do you physically store it when no single hard drive is anywhere near big enough? The answer is this really genius idea called a distributed file system. You basically take a whole bunch of computers, link them up, and use some clever software to trick them into acting like one single gigantic hard drive. It's the architectural magic that makes storing all this stuff even remotely possible. So the classic example here is HDFS, the Hadoop Distributed File System. And the best way to think about it is like a huge library. You've got one master librarian. That's the name node. Now, the librarian doesn't hold any of the books, but it has a perfect catalog that knows exactly where every single book is. And then you have thousands of shelves, the data nodes. These are the things that actually store the books, or in our case, the chunks of data. It's a simple idea, but it's incredibly powerful and scalable. But what if one of those shelves, you know, just breaks? Well, HDFS is ready for that. By default, it makes three copies of every single piece of data and scatters them across different servers. That's what this 3x represents. It means you can lose a server. You can even lose a second server at the same time, and your data is still completely safe. That right there is fault tolerance in action. Now, HDFS was totally revolutionary, but the game has changed. Today, for pretty much any new project, the foundation is going to be cloud object storage. Think Amazon S3. These services give you basically unlimited storage, they're ridiculously durable, and you only pay for what you use. They've taken that core idea of distributed storage and turned it into utility. You know, just like electricity. All right, so we've got our petabytes of data all stored away safely. That's great. But data that's just sitting there is pretty useless, right? You need to be able to ask it questions. So let's move up the stack to the processing engine. This is where the magic happens, where we turn all that raw information into actual insights. The first big breakthrough here was from Google, way back in 2004, with a model called MapReduce. It was an absolute workhorse, super reliable for crunching huge datasets in parallel. But then, in 2012, Apache Spark just completely rewrote the rulebook, with a new approach that was all about one thing, speed. So what made Spark so much faster? Well, the key difference, the secret sauce, is all about disk versus memory. See, MapReduce was super cautious. After every single step in a job, it would write the results down to the slow hard drive. Safe, sure, but really, really slow. Spark, on the other hand, tries to do everything it can in the computer's lightning-fast RAM, its memory, and it only writes to the slow disk when it absolutely has to. And yeah, this chart pretty much says it all. For jobs that need to go over the same data again and again, think training a machine learning model, the difference is just mind-blowing. By keeping data in memory, Spark can be literally orders of magnitude faster. It can turn jobs that used to take hours into jobs that take just a few minutes. It's a total game changer. Okay, so we've got our storage and we've got our processing engine. But wait, how do you get thousands of different machines to agree on anything? Who's in charge? Who gets to write what and when? This is where the conductor comes in, the layer that brings some order to the potential chaos of a massive distributed system. And to really get what's going on here, you have to understand a fundamental law of the universe for these systems, the CAP theorem. Seriously, it's like a law of physics for distributed computing. It says you can have three really good things, but when the network gets messy, you can only pick two of them at the same time. So what are these three things? 
Well, partition tolerance just means your system doesn't fall over when the network connection between servers breaks. You kind of have to have that. So the real tough choice is between consistency and availability. Do you want to be consistent, which might mean pausing the system to make sure nobody gets old stale data? Or do you want to be available, meaning you always give an answer, even if that answer is just a little bit out of date? During a network failure, you can't have both. You have to choose. And that's exactly where tools like Apache Zookeeper or algorithms like Raft come into play. You can think of them as the digital traffic cops for the whole cluster. They are built specifically to manage these tough trade-offs, helping the system do critical things like elect a leader or manage shared settings, all while navigating the rules of the CAP theorem. So we have our foundation, our engine, and our conductor. But you know how it is with technology? It never, ever stands still. The core ideas we've just talked about, they're already evolving into new, even more powerful architectures. Right now, the big buzzword you're gonna hear everywhere is the lake house. For years, companies had this messy, cheap data lake for all their raw data, and then a completely separate, really expensive, highly structured data warehouse for their business reports. The whole idea of the lake house is to merge them, to get the absolute best of both worlds all in one single system. And the features this enables are just incredible. We're talking about things that used to be basically impossible on this scale. Things like acid transactions. That's bringing the rock-solid reliability of a traditional database to these enormous files. We're talking about the ability to literally time travel and ask, hey, what did our data look like last Tuesday at 3 p.m.? It's all about having one unified place for everything. Business intelligence, data processing, and machine learning, all on the same data. If you take just one thing away from all of this, let it be this quote. The entire field of big data exists because this simple sentence is true. The rules, the tools, the entire way you think about a problem, it all has to change when you go from gigabytes to petabytes. Scale is the ultimate game changer. And that really leaves us with one final big question. We figured out how to handle the challenges of storage, processing, and coordination for today's scale. But the amount of data we're all creating is just accelerating like crazy. So what's next? What fundamental rule or assumption that we rely on today is going to be the next one to break?